Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, my calling from Mayo Clinic. So uh, this morning, uh, when Carmen and I were walking to uh, the conference, she asked me, why are we presenting uh, incremental data refresh in the ontology working group? That was a good question. I didn't know the answer to it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there is a, uh, a, a slight link back to the ontology. So uh, uh, please bear with me here. So, all right. Uh, before I get into this, uh, I want to give a uh, big thanks to uh, uh, Griffin, uh, because uh, about four or five years ago, when we start thinking about um, doing this, uh, or switching over to uh, incremental data refresh, first thing I did is I reached out to Griffin um, for help, and uh, we ended up meeting in his office for a couple hours uh, after that year's uh, uh, attribute symposium. And a lot of stuff we learned from Griffin uh, really kind of uh, set a tone for the strategy that we used uh, for our, our, our incremental data refresh. So thank you again, Griffin. So why did we do it? So we started our I2B2 back in about 2014. Uh, I think we deployed in 2015. And uh, we started out with about just shy of about 1 billion medical facts. Um, so about 9 million patients, I think. And today, uh, we have gotten to uh, about 4.9 billion uh, medical facts of uh, more than 11 million patients. And it continues to increase. Okay, so just kind of as a uh, uh, general statistic, we add about 5 million facts daily um, for our, our incremental data refresh. When you add it, add it up, you average about 15% growth. So it's really a matter of time uh, before we get to the point really uh, uh, kind of get to the next point is that this uh, complete data refresh is just not sustainable for us. Uh, because of a lot of our infrastructure reasons and the policy reasons, when we used to run our uh, complete data refresh, we are not allowed to uh, run it during the daytime. So we had to do it off hours. And of course, off hours is also a lot of our other areas are also are doing some heavy processing and stuff like that. So this is often interrupted by uh, uh, network issues or server issues. And poor Carmen, uh, who does all the heavy lifting, she had to babysit the process. And after the, the refresh is done, then we had to run a bunch of uh, regression uh, tests to make sure that we didn't mess up something, right? So the whole process ended up taking about a week. Um, but the good news is though, um, we didn't have to bring our, uh, our production I2B2 down for, for the entire week. Uh, we have three different environments. We have a, a production, we have an integration, and we have a development environments. So what we do is that, or what we did, is that we run our, uh, we run our ETL to the integration environments. And when it's done, then after we, we, we do the testing, we then uh, copy it over from the integration to the uh, production uh, database. And so between, uh, so we drop all the index, we copy the data over, then we rebuild the index. So the real downtime for our production environments is about four hours, okay, so that's manageable. And the other reason that we also, uh, that drive us to uh, uh, incremental data refresh is uh, uh, we often get requests for, from our I2B2 users that are hoping for more up-to-date data. Uh, we, used to try to stay on uh, every three months uh, uh, data refresh. But frankly, sometimes we don't make that target. And we have many use cases that really would like to see data uh, more current than three months old. Uh, one of them really is for recruitment. And we build some uh, plugins to help our, our uh, study teams use I2B2 as a way to not only identify the cohort, but we identify the patient, export data, so they can actually recruit, recruit those patients. And the other big reason is that our user, I'm sorry, our uh, leadership in research uh, kept uh, uh, pressing me to go to uh, uh, incremental data refresh. Okay. So that's many, uh, some of the major reasons that push us to uh, uh, move to uh, incremental data refresh. So how we do it? So about, I wanna say, 90% of our data come from our uh, enterprise data warehouse, uh, which was called a, a unified data platform. And now it's actually been migrated to, uh, uh, to the cloud uh, as we speak. Uh, it's actually the, 
the migration is gonna, gonna uh, complete by July 1st, you know, which is next Monday. And we do get some other data, like our biobank and uh, some of our uh, 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 like a tapestry project data. We don't get it from the enterprise data warehouse, but that's a small fraction. And I also, I believe we get our uh, uh, care everywhere data from uh, directly from an uh, EPIC uh, query. Okay. But other than that, everything's from uh, uh, our UDP. And the nice thing about getting from our, our uh, UDP is that every record has a daytime step in what they call a uh, uh, short system key which come or get into more details, which is you know, really a vital for, for the success of our in incremental data refresh. And the other thing we, we landed on is uh, uh, how often should we do our incremental? Because we had talked about, should we do it weekly, daily, monthly, or any other cadence, or even do some sort of wrong robin? Because we were concerned about how long it's gonna take. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we add about five million uh, records every every day, and we've been doing data uh, incremental data refresh since uh, what I'm say May 2021, so about three years now. We started out uh, about I want to say hour 40 minutes, Carmen, mm -hmm. and now it's about two hour 40 minutes. Okay, and some of that has to do with uh, some of the things that we'll, we'll talk about later. So we, we, we landed on a uh, daily incremental because uh, we kind of find out that doing it weekly doesn't really make a lot of sense because you end up with uh, more data um, and it's gonna take longer. And the other thing is that after we start um, experiment with it, we found that uh, our daily incremental data refresh is actually very reliable. And the other thing we did, which I think was critical is that uh, we did, did uh, uh, ask for help from our enterprise data warehouse people because uh, they've done a lot of these. Our, our uh, um, enterprise data warehouse, most of the data is also refreshed daily. So they have a lot of experience about how to make that ETL run faster. Um, and so we, we actually, even though it's a, a come as a, as a expense, I was very happy that we actually did it because it really helped us to make our uh, uh, ETL run as fast as possible. Okay. So I'm gonna let Carmen talk about some of the, uh, the kind of the prominent uh, behind our uh, incremental data refresh. Carmen. Yeah, so uh, we switched from a single uh, uh, fact table to multiple fact tables and that actually helped uh, with our um, the performance of our incremental ETL, uh, because um, f for the ETL we use SSIS, and uh, when we bulk insert into the fact table, that table is locked. So uh, by switching to multi-fact uh, tables, uh, that allows you know parallel processing of of a different. Uh, fact tables like diagnosis. Um, we have a diagnosis module in the ETL and that gets processed in parallel with, you know, medications or, or others. And they um, they can be processed in parallel because um, uh, also at the end, um, you know, they don't, in, those modules don't insert uh, into the same, uh, records into the same table. So they have, uh, separate tables uh, to, to do that insert. Um, like uh, Michael said, um, the source table are from a generalized data mart where, uh, you know, um, there are dimension tables and fact tables, so very similar to uh, the I2B2 data structure, right? Um, uh, in this generalized data mart, uh, in the fact tables, in the dimension tables, um, one of the columns is the source system key, which is a unique record identifier that uh, remain, remains the same um, once it's cr uh, that record is created and then uh, updated, um, you know, uh, later on. So, so um, that is a key element uh, also that uh, allows us to, um, 
decide when we uh, run our incremental ETL whether that uh, whether a record is uh, new and needs to be um, inserted into our, into our fact table or that record already exists in the fact table and we just need to update it. Um, also, these um, source tables have an uh, update date or it, the, the name of the field is actually row loaded date. And uh, we go by that, um, the value of that um, field to determine which records were uh, updated uh, during the, you know, that day, one day, uh, the previous day, right? And uh, that need to be processed during one iteration of the incremental ETL. Um, one of the facts, we don't um, enforce primary key, uh, the primary key on our fact tables. Just uh, one reason would be um, when we update um, some of the records, um, they might become duplicates of already existing records and we don't want to go into that, um, the problem of having uh, uh, errors you know, uh, in, in our ETL because of that constraint. Um, we have a diagram here that kind of shows the process. So the iteration has to do, we have an iteration log table where we insert the record just to every day, I mean, every time we run this ETL, just to keep track of the data that was processed. So it's basically, a uh, record that uh, uh, has the, the start date and time of our um, ETL. And at the end of the ETL, is if it uh, finishes successfully, we also uh, mark that into an uh, end iteration field. Um, so we know uh, that specific date that the the data from the source tables was successfully updated um, because if there is a failure in the ETL for whatever reason, um, network errors and things like that, um, and the ETL doesn't finish successfully, uh, then the next day we will process two days worth of data. So we go back to, to make sure we don't miss uh, any of the, that data. So uh, we start by um, updating our patient dimension and mapping tables <coughs> um, and the patient demographics in there. And uh, once that is done, um, <coughs> we, like I said, we run in parallel diagnosis updates, lab tests, vitals, there's some dependency sometimes between some of these modules. So some of the modules start after other modules finish, like for instance, the procedures updates have to start after the diagnosis updates are done. <clears throat> but for the most part, all these modules run in parallel and um, insert data into, you know, different tables. And um, <clears throat> if everything at the end, if everything ran successfully, the iteration is closed and we know the data uh, from the data source from the previous day was processed successfully. So the next day we can go ahead and update the data on the, you know, based on the, the next day from the data source. And um, yeah, that's basically uh, how the whole process goes. So, uh, what we have learned from this whole process. So, first of all, we're really happy that we did it. Um, and now I know our users are very happy we did it. And if we didn't do the incremental data refresh, my, my guess is that if we continue with our uh, uh, complete data refresh, that process would take us at least two weeks, given the amount of data we have today. And we do have some... Uh, uh, like I said earlier, that we do have some uh, occasional interruptions, uh, mostly due to uh, you know runtime uh, performance or stuff like that. 
But overall, it's really a, a, a much more reliable uh, process than, than I had expected personally. And this also really significantly expand the use cases about I2B2. You know, I mentioned about the recruitment, but you know, it's kind of like a lot of tools, you know, like Red Cap I2B2, you put it out there, and you don't know how people are using it. And just very recently, uh, I learned from uh, one of the group of users, they're actually not in research. Um, they are in practice. Uh, so what they do is that they use I2B2 to generate uh, a bunch of facts. You know, we have built, we have some uh, 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 plugins that we put into our I2B2. They were able to use the, the, the plugins to actually generate some uh, or get a report or data export from I2B2 about their patients that are coming in the following week uh, with an appointment the following week. So that's the use, one of the use cases that wouldn't be possible if we didn't have uh, data uh, incremental data refresh. And then here's a scene that's gonna tie us a little bit back into the ontology. In the past, we always get respect, well, even today, we get uh, requests from our users about adding certain data to our uh, I2B2. And but our hands were tied because any, any new data, vital sign, SDOH, uh, whatever data, you know, search code stuff, is going to expand the amount of data. And so I always feel like we, we, our hands were tied having to consider that. But now with the, the incremental data refresh, you know, we, we have a lot more freedom to actually uh, expand the data domain if we can justify the use case. And this also, you know, I mentioned that uh, used, used to be this tie up uh, a lot of common time um, to uh, work on the, the, the incremental, uh, in, work on the data refresh. And now um, we can free up those resources to do a lot of uh, much, more, much more needed work uh, for I2B2. So overall, I really think this is a worthwhile uh, exercise. And I also heard from a couple of uh, other uh, uh, institution uh, colleagues from other institutions is that they are also getting to the point after 10 or 15 years or even longer of uh, using I2B2, they accumulated, accumulated data to the point. They are also starting to worry about if the complete data refresh is really sustainable in the longer term future. And this is kind of the, one of the reasons why uh, uh, we, in our working group, we started to maybe a worthwhile uh, presentation uh, to make. So thank you. Well, uh, should we take question now or later? Questions? What do you think, Michelle? Would you rather? Okay, yeah. If we have questions for Carmen and Michael, happy to take some now. Yep. We have, oh, actually, I'm going to switch that on. Carmen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, very important work here. And uh, um, my question is actually, as you mentioned, is that since there are so many I2B2 sites, do we have kind of individual sites updated record date? Because sort of uh, I'm thinking at the publication point of view, oftentimes we say, you know, we have to sort of where do we get our data and the date right? So I was curious about what's out there and is there sort of a, a, uh, a push that every site, like you're saying, to make it updated more frequently and really record that date per se? Yeah, I guess I don't have a good answer to, to your question. Maybe uh, uh, others uh, in, the, in the audience uh, may have some insight into that. Anyone, Griffin? So th th there's a local I2B2 and a Shrine version at Answer. You know, a local version, I think people handle it different ways. Like in my institution, I have a homepage for I2B2, and it says the last updated date and when frequency is done. Um, right now, that information is somewhat invisible to Shrine. I think it would be useful in a tool like Shrine or Federated Network if there's site, site status information. For example, what version of I2B2 you're running, when the date data was last updated. When we were doing COVID work earlier on, people would update different kinds of data at different frequencies. So COVID status might be updated nightly, whereas some of the other things were weekly. Um, we, doing something like that will require some changes to ITB2 APIs in the Shrine software. But um, as 
you get to a big network, like our NAC network, 50 sites, every site has a different update date and slightly different types of data and different versions in it. Um, so, you know, it's an uh, it's important um, feature, as you said, for a lot of research questions that we don't display in the network currently. Okay. Thank you, Griffin. Really nice work. Um, two kind of caveats. One of them is, so you rely on the source, uh, what do you call it, the source system key, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And where does that go in I2B2? Source system CD. Source system CD. Yeah, and the source system key at the huh. source, it's actually a concatenation and you know, like with a delimiter in it of multiple fields like encounter number at the source, I mean, yeah. Um, patient number, um, you know, a provider ID, stuff like that, so that it, it really represents that record in a unique way. Uh, yeah. Right. So, so like a encounter and all the facts associated with it would all have the same source system CD, and then you would kind right. of process it that way. Right. So basically, we decide first uh, base of of, of the um, so that source system key if we have it at I to B two that then that goes on a branch for updating, huh. okay? We do in certain uh, staging tables, right. those records, and so separate tables. Uh, if not, uh, those get directly inserted, those records get directly inserted. And after the inserts, we basically do the updates. It's so, yeah. But you can, but you can do it on a fact-by-fact -fact basis. Rather than like, okay. Yeah. And then um, one thing that's kind of obvious, I guess, is so some source systems have very unreliable update dates associated with them. I think this is something we've run into. Now, some are, some are great, like HL7 messaging mm -hmm. lends itself really well to daily updates. And, um, but there are some kinds of, especially, um, uh, financial systems, which are really bad at having the correct update date. So the problem is that people can go in and like manually update things in the database and there's no record of that because they won't change an update date on the column. So then you actually get out of sync mm -hmm. uh, with those transactions that were done kind of manually on the source system. And so, like periodically, the way to overcome some of that is periodically, um, you do a whole, you do a, a, a complete refresh, right? Just because, you know, that's the only reliable way in some ways to restore the synchronicity. Yeah, Sean, you're exactly right. Uh, we actually uh, uh, been talking about that, uh, is that we should probably buy the bullet uh, maybe every, not very frequent, maybe every year, every other year, uh, we should do a complete data refresh just to be sure. You know, because one of the things that I do be too is that if you have a data error, you don't know until somebody reported, right? That's always mm -hmm. kind of scare, scare me a little bit. Um, the good news is that the nature of the way the, the tools are used, uh, is used. Usually if you are by a little bit, it's not a, it's not a really big deal. Uh, but you do worry about it, you, you accumulate, right? Yeah, so very good point. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the very excellent talk. And um, my question is uh, really similar. How do you handle mergers, implicit or explicit mergers, with identificators? Because, um, I mean, we have a t talk later on, and we'll get into that, but uh, we import EHR basically whenever they are closed inside the documentation system and we have big issues with uh, implicit or explicit mergers. So for example, if you have a patient that arrives and uh, he gets assigned a number because he's a patient number because he's unconscious and then if you import the data on, at a later point of time, maybe he can have or she can have a, a, a different patient number. So you have two different records and uh, that's something that is a big issue for us because we have troubles 
um, identifying double cases from the source system. So how do you handle m such mergers? Yeah, we do handle uh, patient merges uh, every day in the, the CTL. Um, so the source of data warehouse, they do have in their patient dimension, uh, whenever they do merges, they, they mark, you know, the, the old patient clinic number and the new patient clinic number in separate columns, right? So we know, and also though that those records have an update date we rely on to gather the list of patients that were merged that day, so we get that list. And the way we merge them in I2B2 is by basically, uh, you know, of course we mark them as merged, but in, in the patient dimension, we actually null out all the um, uh, demographics, yeah? And then, um, so while we keep that old um, number, um, it won't come up in queries, basically, based on any criteria, right? So that's the idea. And uh, so, yeah, we do. I was going to say we use demographics. We don't have facts for demographics. We actually use the demographics and the patient dimension. That's why we want to null them out so there's no. And also, we update the facts, all the facts for that patient and replace the old, uh, you know, I2B2 patient um, with the new one, I mean the correct one that the patient was merged into, right? So we, we make sure to do that too, as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I should add to a comment there. Um, in our I2B2, we have a slight modification in our login screen. We put our, what we call a bulletin board in there. So we can actually post a, a message there. So I think we used to, to put our date last update day in there uh, when we were doing a, a complete data refresh. But we also use it to announce some things that's not obvious. Like maybe we added a lot a plugin, or maybe we, you know, added another uh, uh, data domain to the I2B2. Because I don't know your experience, but a mail, people just don't read their emails. <laughs> so you email them about these things, it won't get their attention. So it's, it's easy, we just put it in the, in the bulletin board. So I hope that, that that answers part of your question. I think there was a question from back there. I don't know if still. Yep, we have time for one more question if you want to step up to the mic. Yeah, I wasn't sure there's enough time, so I was going to ask you during the break. So a whole bunch of questions. One is that uh, for the database system, which one do you use? Uh, SQL Silver. Okay. And uh, you use multiple fact tables, and uh, does the query tool natively support multiple fact tables? Okay, yeah, perfect. And the last question is that uh, <laughs> a whole bunch of them. So for these expanded use cases, you talk about trial recruitment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, do they do that in Epic already? And uh, you're offering something new that they, how do you actually convince yeah. them? Yeah, very good question. Um, so at Mayo, we have a few different solutions for people to, uh, uh, to help with their recruitment. They can use a slicer dicer, Epic tool. We have uh, our, uh, Enterprise Data Warehouse have their own query engine called MDE, and then there's the I2B2. And so we actually met with all this group and talked about should we consolidate you know, into a, maybe a single tool, but we, find out, we found out is that they can all support different use cases. You know, every, every tool has kind of their strengths and their shortcomings. So at, at the end, we decided to um, maintain all three tools. But we also provide a, uh, you can get, get called it a consultation service. Depending on the use case, we, we try to direct them to the right tool. I hope that answers your question. So, yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. Round of applause for Carmen and Michael. Thanks very much. We'll switch back to Michelle.